Today we conclude our six years of table classes as well as our series on the parables of Jesus in Luke. The text that we'll be looking at today is Luke chapter 14 verses 25 through 35, which I believe contains one of the uh, most challenging, personally challenging portions of scripture. But as we've seen, as we've studied scripture together in the table class, the challenging texts are so vital for our growth as believers. And when we're done today, I hope that you'll agree that Jesus' words on the cost of discipleship, on the cost of following him, are no exception. Our agenda for the class today is a course to read the passage, and then we're going to see what Jesus thought of large crowds. What was Jesus' view of the large crowd? We're also going to unpack two parallel statements about the cost of discipleship. Then we're going to explore two small and mercifully, mostly self-explanatory parables then we're going to study a third statement on the cost of discipleship. And finally, we're going to round it all out by learning from a, what I think is a fascinating, fascinating saltiness metaphor that puts it all together. Uh, if you're watching somewhere else, the words will appear on the screen for our scripture today, Luke 14. If you're here and you have one of these uh, sheets, you can follow along as, as I read through the passage. Now... Great crowds accompanied Jesus, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or, what king? Going out to encounter another king in war will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000. And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is of no use either for the soil or for the manure pile. It is thrown away. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Let's pray. Father, as Jesus just said, we want ears to hear what you are saying. We trust that you got a hold of your servant Luke and you caused him to record accurately the words of Jesus that we've just read. Would you in your mercy and grace send your Holy Spirit to make these words come alive in us as never before for our good and for your glory in the earth. We pray this in Jesus' name. So what did Jesus think of large crowds? Now, great crowds accompanied him, our scripture begins. Well, of course, of course, great crowds accompanied Jesus. They were amazed at his teaching, Matthew tells us, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, because, quote, he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. Jesus performed miracles. He fulfilled prophecy. 
there simply was no one like him. He was the son of God incarnate. Of course, the crowds followed Jesus. Great crowds. How many today want to be followed by a great crowd? How many today are looking for a great crowd? The more people that follow, the more successful the messenger, right? There's a tendency, even in the modern church, to assume that if the church is drawing a lot of people, it must be because that church is being faithful to the gospel. If only that were true. If only that were true. A friend of mine interviewed, and I've told this story before, a friend of mine interviewed many years ago for a pastoral position at a large church here in our area. When my friend mentioned the church where he previously served, the pastor of this large church with thousands of attenders said, I know all about your old church. This church is the Ferrari of churches. We do it right. Everybody knows it. We're kind of a big deal. But Jesus was not seeking large crowds during his ministry. He was seeking and is seeking faithful followers. You might recall there was another occasion, we've studied it in this this, uh, table class, where there was a large crowd following Jesus. We found that in John chapter 6. And the Lord preaches this sermon that whittles the crowd slowly down to the 12 apostles. Right? We would call that a ministry fail if we had a sermon like that on Sunday morning where people are up and leaving. To those 12 disciples, Jesus said, do you want to go away as well? Peter answered, Lord, to whom should we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. You have the words of eternal life. Jesus, you are the Holy One of God. The Holy One of God, with the words of eternal life, does not say to the crowd in our passage, follow me and you'll have a better family life, a more successful career, the respect of your community, a fantastic church experience, and good health. No, no. Jesus is not one to hide the fine print. Satan is the one who hides the fine print. He draws the crowd to his messengers with sweeping promises of self-fulfillment, never mentioning that his goal is not to share eternal life, but rather to steal, kill, and destroy. I have an amazing offer, customized just for you, Satan. Jesus consistently says the opposite. For example, in Matthew 7, we read, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to eternal life, and those who find it are few. I need to tell you, Jesus says, person cannot divide their loyalties between me and other things. You've got to give it everything you've got if you want to be one of my recruits. So here is where we come to the two parallel statements on discipleship. Great crowds accompanied him and he turned and said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, Yes, and even his own life. He cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. What can we learn from this? So much, it turns out. Let's focus on four things. Four things that these two parallel statements about the cost of discipleship teach us. And in your notes, if you're here in class, I have a, uh, 
there's just a little place to fill in the blanks here. If, you, if you're a fill in the blank kind of person, um, if you wanna follow along, I'll try and make sure that I repeat them enough times so that, um, that you have those things. So the first thing that we learn, the first thing that we learn about the cost of discipleship is that it is, it is for all believers. It is for all believers. Jesus does not allow for different classes of believers. He doesn't say, some of you can be sort of committed to me, and the rest of you will be deeply devoted. <laughs> we either follow Jesus as he commands, or we don't. We either follow him as he commands, or we don't. If anyone comes to Jesus and doesn't in some way hate, we're going to get to that word and talk about it, but in some way hate his dearest relations, even himself, he cannot be my disciple. Oh, and whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Anyone, whoever. Anyone, whoever. Jesus brings life, true life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. But he is upfront about the cost. There is no bait and switch with Jesus. Discipleship is for each of us, not just for the professional church workers among us, not just for the deacons and the elders, not just for the people who come every single Sunday and have their spot, but for all of us. To each, to each one, is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. That means that everyone in this room, everyone watching, everyone who has never even heard about these classes, which is, by the way, the majority of the human race, <laughs> who happens to follow Jesus and is, and is one of his disciples, has a spiritual gift for the body. And you cannot use your gift and not be part of the body. <clears throat> As the people of God, we are priests. We are priests representing him to one another and to the world and interceding on behalf of one another and the world to him. Discipleship is for all of us. So that's the first thing. Second thing. The second thing we learn from these parallel statements is, as Dietrich Bonhoeffer put it, when Jesus calls us, he calls us to die. He calls us to die. The call to discipleship, if you're working on this form, <clears throat> is to an unexpected death. It's to an unexpected death. For some, the death is a physical death. There are some people in the world that are teaching a class somewhere where they're actually at risk of their lives for doing it. And so are all the people who are in that class, who are worshiping or at church, even maybe in their own homes. So for some, the death is physical. But in all cases, in every case, we must die to our expectations about what our lives should look like. We also should die to our expectations about what our church should look like. We have to die to our expectations. We have to die to self, to autonomy. So... Jesus says to Peter, who's sort of standing in for all of us, he says, Peter, when you were young, you were able to do as you liked. You dressed yourself and went wherever you wanted to go. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and others will dress you and take you where you do not want to go. During the pandemic, uh, like many people, I started making sourdough bread. How many of you have been bread makers? over the pandemic, just, uh, okay, so you have a couple, right? Um, that makes sense, because nothing but time, right, for, for many months. Um, so, you know, I started making sourdough, and I'm sure you know the bread making process with sourdough requires the use of a starter, which activates the dough. The starter is a fermented mixture of water and flour. I use a scale, to ensure that I have exactly the right amount of water and flour in my starter. It's one part water to one part flour, right? So I randomly pour out the flour, 122 grams, 
I'm going to add 122 grams of water uh, to replenish my starter. Some of us are acting as if Jesus is merely the starter to our lives. You measure one part Jesus for every one or two parts of something else, like our friendships, our family, our careers, our aspiration, our leisure, our politics. We don't want to be too religious, too committed, too strange for the world, but we also don't want to miss out on all the advantages of connecting with the one who's, who has the words of eternal life. We want this both and Christianity. Jesus will have none of that. We don't stir a little of him into our lives. We don't come to him to be a better parent, a better child, a better neighbor. We don't encourage people to follow him to save our community, our nation, or our world. Now, of course, following him is going to improve our ability to love. Our discipleship may positively affect the world around us. In fact, it likely will. But Jesus isn't here to help us build the kingdom of man. He isn't here to help us build the kingdom of man. He is here to call us into the kingdom of God. As Tim Keller puts it, you don't fit him into your goals. He becomes the new goal. At any moment, the disciple of Jesus must be prepared to do something unexpected, to die in some way to the world and its ways. In first century Palestine, just like it's true in many traditional cultures today, the family was the center of daily life. You didn't leave your family. You didn't disobey or dishonor your parents. Your major decisions, including when and where and whom to marry, were made by and in consideration of your family. Jesus goes right at that cultural expectation in Luke chapter 14. Your culture is not definitive. He is. He is not the holy means to your ends. You are the means to his holy ends. Yes, his ends will be wonderful for you. They will be exciting, satisfying, and fulfilling, but they are his ends, and you must commit to them. So imagine, if you will, you're a Jewish person in the first century who's decided to follow Jesus as Messiah, as Lord. It would mean likely alienation from your family, from the center of your daily life. As we've seen throughout our table class studies, following Jesus for these early believers meant loss of employment, of status, of security. Would you follow Jesus under these circumstances? You may yet have that opportunity because a disciple of Jesus has to make her allegiances clear. All right, so, so far we've seen that no Christian is exempt from the call to discipleship. We've seen that discipleship is the call to an unexpected death. And now third, we're gonna see that the call to, this, to discipleship is the call to love the Lord more. The call, number three, is to love the Lord more. Deeply, wholeheartedly, and without rival. Marlon, I'm not going to pick on you, but I already know the answer because years ago, you told me something about this text. Do you remember what you said about this passage? I hate this passage. You did. So I know what you think. But what did the rest of you think? What did the rest of you think when I read those words of Jesus that you've got to hate everything that matters to you to be a disciple? Honestly, how does that strike you? Don't like it. That's like, that's like the G-rated version was coming down from the PG version I heard years ago. Yeah. Define hate. Good question, good thought. 
Define hate. We're going to do that here. The call to hate, it turns out, is not literal, but rhetorical. It's not literal, it's rhetorical. In fact, in the Semitic culture, in the Jewish culture of the Old Testament and the New Testament, the verb to hate does not always mean to feel an intense and passionate dislike for someone or something. It doesn't always mean to feel an intense and passionate dislike. It can also mean to love something or someone less than something or someone else. It can be used comparatively. So Greg Boyd summarizes this. He writes, in Hebraic thought, when love and hate are contrasted, they are usually meant hyperbolically. Hyperbole is a style of speaking. Jesus made use of it. The idea is there's um, a dramatic statement for effect, often an exaggerated statement for effect. Uh, it's a teaching tool. The expression simply means, the idea of hating simply means to strong or loving, to, to strongly prefer one person, one person or thing over another. So Tim Keller points out, by the way, pray for Tim. Uh, Tim's now has stage four. Not you, Tim, but Tim Keller has stage four pancreatic cancer. Um, so pray for him. Pray for his family. His spirits are very high. Um, they really are um, because he's a disciple of Jesus. And we're going to talk about, talk about uh, some of that later. But uh, Tim Keller points out a very helpful example from the Old Testament about this use of love and hate. Okay, so... He points to uh, verse 30 of chapter 29, when Jacob is said to have loved his wife, Rachel, more than his wife, Leah. Okay, so in verse 30, we are clearly told that Jacob loves Rachel more than Leah. That is a complicated domestic life, but whatever. Uh, he loves Rachel more than Leah. Okay, so that's verse 30. His sentiment, loving Rachel more than Leah, is characterized as hatred of Leah in verse 31. Okay, so the first verse, Jacob loves Rachel more than Leah. Second verse, it's characterized, Jacob's sentiment is characterized as hatred of Leah. When the Lord saw that Leah was Hated, that is, when the Lord saw that Leah was loved less than Rachel, he opened her womb. But Rachel was barren, right? Because God loves the brokenhearted, right? He reaches out and he loves this woman, despite the fact that her husband prefers his other wife. Complicated domestic life. But the thing we want to know and, and take away from this is verse 30. We talk about Jacob loving Rachel more, and that's explained in verse 31 as hatred of uh, Leah, right? Make sense? So we're following that? See, it's a common idea in Hebraic thought. So of course, God does not want us to actively despise our parents, our spouses, our children, our siblings, or ourselves. According to Jesus, the law can be summarized, it can be summed up in Leviticus 19.18. Love your neighbor, right? Love your neighbor as yourself. Paul writes, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Jesus himself quotes the Old Testament law. For God commanded, honor your father and your mother and... Whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. And then, even earlier in Luke chapter 6, verse 27, Jesus tells his audience, Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. Pray for those who abuse you. So if Jesus was teaching in today's passage that his disciples had to actively despise their family, friends, and selves, 
he was contradicting his own teaching throughout the scriptures. And if there's one theme that we've come back to over and over again in, in our time together, it is this. If we read the Bible in a way that makes it contradict itself, we aren't doing it right. That having been said, I am not, I am not trying to cover over the hard aspect of Jesus' teaching. But Jesus is clearly using an idiom of his time. Our love for Jesus must be so strong, our zeal for him must be so unqualified that our regard for our parents, our spouses, our children, even our interest in our own comfort must look like hatred by comparison. If your commitment, if my commitment to any relationship is such that it draws you or me away from being fully devoted as a follower of Jesus, it means too much to us. It means too much to us. Now remember who it is who's saying all of these hard things. It's the one who left heaven to be born on Christmas in that manger, who lived a sinless life, who suffered and died this brutal and undeserved death on the cross, all so that we could spend eternity with him. No one loves us more fully, more powerfully, and more effectively than Jesus. Right? Amen? No one loves us like that. Love for the Lord is to be the driving force of our lives. It's to eclipse all other loves. I want to be caught up in that kind of love, don't you? Don't you want to have that kind of love for the Lord? I want it to exceed the love I have for myself, for my friends, for my family, for my wife. And my love for my family is pretty strong, right, buddy? Yeah, that's right. Don't forget it. <laughs> Don't forget it. Um, Tim Keller, <clears throat> brilliant man that he is, uh, calls us back to look at the work of another brilliant man, St. Augustine. And St. Augustine was very helpful in his writings in addressing the question of how we live a life that honors God, that experiences peace, that says no to besetting sins. It is not personal discipline. I mean, discipline is good, right? A discipline is important. But the key to a godly character is not developing some sort of personal power. It is, according to St. Augustine, the reordering of our loves. <coughs> reordering our loves. So some of us are paralyzed by our failures as a son or daughter, as a spouse, or as a parent. Some of us put ourselves out there once or twice or ten times, and we were burned for it. We, you know, grasped for that brass ring, and we fell flat. So we often respond by saying something like, well, that stuff didn't matter anyway. It's just stuff. It's just, you know, it doesn't really matter. It's not important. Or we respond with actual hatred, right, of those things, of the things that hurt us. And they probably do deserve some measure of condemnation. But as Augustine demonstrated, or as Augustine demonstrated, however, the key to overcoming our past hurts is not to love the ones who hurt us less or to hate them. The solution is not to denigrate the things that we once valued and hoped for. It's to love the Lord more than those people and those things. It's to reorder our loves. In Keller's words, the essence of a transformed character is to hate these things comparatively. So we need Jesus to be our Rachel, don't we? We need him to be the star that outshines all the other lights in the sky. We need him to loom so large in our life that his gravity pulls us away from other things. Lord, please give us that kind of love for you. All right, Romans 3, uh, Romans 5, verses 3 to 5. Uh, this, is a, this is the kind of uh, phrasing that we see in Scripture, right? So it's going to sound very familiar. Uh, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame. Okay, so far very familiar. 
because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. The disciple loves Jesus more than he loves other people, more than she loves other things. We can suffer hurts and wrongs, slings and arrows, and not be overcome. Why? Because, because the Lord pours his love into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. God wants us to love him, and he helps us do it. He gives us the spirit that helps us enter into the love that's at the center of the universe. And as I've, and I've discovered, <clears throat> the more time that I spend in the word of God, the greater my love for him is. Right? I've discovered that, whether it's studying in a group like this or it's in private personal devotion. Is that true for you? I see some nodding, right? I see nodding. So this is important stuff. So to recap, our two parallel statements teach us that discipleship is for all, not just for the super believer, whoever that might be. It's a commitment to follow despite the unexpected death that results. And it's dominated by love for God over other things and other people. And fourth, the disciple walks in Jesus' shoes. That's number four. The disciple walks in Jesus' shoes. We, like Jesus, take up our crosses and follow him. You know, a lot of people have said it more eloquently than I can. It may be... I would call it a pretty obvious observation. When you pick up your cross, you are picking up the instrument of your own death. Right? I mean, that is the purpose of the cross. In his preface to his book, Dominion, historian Tom Holland, historian Tom Holland writes of crucifixion. This is um, his takeaway from his study of the, of the ancient practice. <clears throat> to be hung naked, long in agony, swelling with ugly wheels on shoulders and chest, Helpless to beat away the clamorous birds, such a fate Roman intellectuals agreed was the worst imaginable. This, in turn, was what rendered it so suitable a punishment for slaves. When the Roman soldiers led a man to be crucified, it was customary for that person to carry his own cross. And everyone would see him on the journey and know that he was in a really bad situation. Once the cross is taken up, things end only one way. The phrase that we use is dead man walking. Luke 14, as it turns out, is actually the second time in the Gospel of Luke where Jesus talks about taking up the cross. So earlier in chapter 9, we read, that, quote, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. Daily. So whether or not you and I took up our crosses yesterday, today turns out to be a new day. It turns out to be a new opportunity to bear the cross. So being a Christian is more than being a good person or an improved person. Jesus says what he says in part to eliminate the possibility that following him is an insignificant small matter. It's more than a religious experience. It's more than the feeling you get when you sing in the crowd at church. I recently read, uh, I would call it testimony, about a person who lost his faith in Christ at a Coldplay concert. Now, you guys know Coldplay. Coldplay is a multi-platinum uh, winning group, selling group. Uh, they, they travel the world and people pay hundreds of millions of dollars to see them in concert. They're not U2 big, but they're, they're pretty big. They might get there to be U2 big, some, U2 big someday. And the lead singer, it turns out, is a, a pastor's son. And the words that they use in these songs have religious overtones, although he is very clear that he is not producing any sort of Christian music. So this person who lost their faith at a Coldplay concert discovered themselves singing the lyrics and swaying to the music in the crowd exactly the same way they did on Sunday morning worshiping in church with the same feelings. Of course, 
a faith that can be lost like that is really no faith at all. A saving faith is demonstrated by a changed life, perseverance in, 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 in faith, and by suffering for Christ, not having all the feels in a worship service. What do I give up when I bear the cross? My possessions? My comfort, my security, my family, my financial accounts, and importantly, my reputation. This one's a hard one for me. It's really hard for me. In the past couple of years, I've felt like following Christ has cost me friendships, even in the church. And yet I know that I have not suffered for the Lord or for his church anywhere near what the Lord has suffered for you and for me. What do I gain? When I take up the cross, what do I gain indeed? For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. When God looks at you and me, he doesn't see all of our failures of discipleship. He doesn't see our sins. He isn't looking to punish us for them. You and I are irrevocably <coughs> saved from the wrath of God. When you and I bear our crosses, we aren't suffering for our own sins. We aren't suffering for our own sins. We're identifying with the Lord that we love. And we're modeling to the world the great thing that he has done. So like the Apostle Paul, we know our rightness comes by faith. Not by cross-bearing. It comes by faith. What matters to us is knowing him and the power of his resurrection and sharing in Jesus' sufferings, becoming like him in his death. Our suffering matters because it shows we are persevering in faith. It also matters because it's our witness to the world. Take your best shot, kingdom of man. You can't hurt us. You cannot hurt us. Carrying our crosses is in some mystical way identifying with and loving the Lord. Do you want to identify with Jesus. Then pick up and carry your cross. You don't have to look far, Bonhoeffer points out, to find your cross. You probably stumble over it every day. You just have to look down and pick it up. Right? I want to pause for a minute. How does all this strike you? This is really heavy stuff. This is really heavy stuff. So what, what sorts of things are you thinking or feeling? Bobby. Just off the top of my head. Um, I tend, there's a tendency for me at this point in time to be more consumed with things that really don't matter social media, the mm. news, things that, of which I have no control. <laughs> and I recognize that I overlook the things that are right before me. Yeah. to where I do have an impact, whether it's uh, talking with someone at the line in the grocery store or, you know, having uh, the contact communication with family and friends, those, you know, the, the imminent, yes. as opposed to the transcendent. I'm sometimes you know, more distracted by stuff that really doesn't matter. Yeah. Distracted. Yeah, me too. It missed looking down and picking down my cross. Yeah. Yeah. So this is the exact opposite of what the world was telling us. If we are, it isn't about personal discipline, not pulling ourselves up by our bootstraps, not uh, being more enlightened, any of that. We can switch the focus to loving Jesus more. That is um, yeah. so yeah. difficult to mess with what we hear every day, every day. Right. Right. It feels to me like we need more, or at least I feel like I need more conversation with people of like mine in order to <laughs> help me. Yeah. Because, and maybe help them too, but uh, it's a hard subject. I don't really understand it truly. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of mysterious elements to all of this. Yeah. What, what it is, exactly. Yeah. yeah. 
Thank you for all that. Right. Yeah. Jeff. I, I really like when you went to Romans one seventeen there. And, uh, that that really gave me comfort. You talked about our our union with Christ. You know, and yeah. our union with Christ gives us the confidence to pick up our cross. And you just nailed right. that. Yeah. 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 Bless. Um, everybody dies and everybody suffers. It's a uh, universal experience. And anyone who tells you they haven't suffered is um, not paying attention to their own lives. Uh, everyone suffers. But uh, only the believer suffers and dies for an eternal purpose. Only we have the privilege of having our suffering transformed into witness, into glory, into pleasing our Lord. That's, we are so unique in that. God takes the worst that can happen to us, and he works it somehow. He doesn't call it good, but he works it for our good, right? Okay, so having considered these two parallel statements and learned the four uh, points about the cost of discipleship, we get to come to these two mostly self-explanatory parable, parables. If anyone by grace has not been dissuaded from following Jesus <clears throat> due to his calls to hate and to carry, then perhaps these parables will be instructive. Again, for which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and to count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to encounter another king in war, will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. He surrenders, right? There is no great complexity with these parables. They are easy to understand. Let's start with the tower builder. According to Daryl Bach, the type of tower that Jesus had in mind was used to provide security for a private residence, probably for a landowner's private residence, but... Um, such towers, Bach writes, could become quite elaborate. It could become quite elaborate and might encompass a barn where produce and tools were located. The reference to the foundation suggests a substantial structure. So the wise tower builder would think about the project before they got started and um, make sure they had enough money to not run out of funds. We're putting in a pool in my backyard, and uh, believe me, we're very sensitive to the the cost of the pool. In fact, uh, with the rain over the next few days, right now it's dirt with frame in it. I am not looking forward to the <coughs> repair of the, the hole in the ground uh, after all of the rain. But we're prepared for some contingencies, right? We didn't spend all of our cash on this pool, right? So you, you plan ahead when you're going to do something. Uh, bless you. In the same way, someone who's thinking about giving her life to Christ ought to ask whether she's willing to see it through to the end. You don't want to lay the foundation only to have to call it, oh, that was my Christian period. That was when I was a, a Christian, you know? You're not going to follow in. Bob Dylan is that the famous guy who had a Christian period. There's lots of folks who had that experience. Jesus presents us with a curious evangelism strategy here. He doesn't say to the crowd, follow me, it'll be easy. Follow me, it'll come up roses. Because it won't be easy, but it'll be worth it. That should be our message too. It won't be easy, but it will be worth it. How do we meaningfully communicate that message? By suffering. By persevering in faith. That's how we communicate to our family, to our loved ones, to our friends. It's, our, it's how we engage with the suffering we're called to do. That's what communicates. It won't be easy, but it'll be worth it. You know, there was a scribe who um, once went to Jesus and said, I'm going to follow you wherever you go, teacher. And Jesus said, famously, foxes have, 
Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And uh, as Pastor uh, Anya Buile notes, this basically means welcome to a life of homelessness and costly sacrifice. Right? It won't be easy, but it will be worth it. After the tower builder, Jesus presents that outnumbered king. The tower builder has this choice. He sits down ahead of time, think about what he wants to do. But the king uh, has the choice thrust upon him. Will he surrender, make peace with the king who has more power? A wise king would do that. So when a person comes to faith in Christ, the logic of being a disciple is actually fairly clear. Put differently, when we actually see the glory of God, when he reveals himself to us, when he shows us our sin and his goodness, there really can only be one response, right? Despite what's given up. As Jim Elliott put it, when he, uh, many years before he was martyred for his faith, he is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. He is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. It won't be easy, but it's worth it. Now we come to Jesus' third statement on the cost of discipleship. So, therefore, if any one of you or any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Clearly, from experience, we know that not everyone who follows Jesus will be called to give away all our possessions, but each of us should be willing to hear and obey that call. Each of us should be prepared to be that person. As Bach writes, Jesus is not a minimalist when it comes to commitment. It is not how little one can give that is the that is the that is the question. It's not how little one can give that is the question, but how much God deserves. How much does God deserve from you and me? What a blessing it is to be able to give to him all that he asks. And I would say what a blessing it is that he receives our gifts. What a blessing. So finally, our text brings us to Jesus' powerful warning about salt that loses its taste, its saltiness. Salt is good, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is of no use, either for the soil or for the manure pile. It is thrown away. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. So the thing is, we know that sodium chloride is a stable molecule. It doesn't, salt doesn't lose salt. It doesn't naturally lose salt. But... In first century Palestine, what they used as salt came from evaporated pools around the Dead Sea. And it was mixed with impurities like gypsum. So salt was this mixture of sodium chloride and a bunch of other stuff. When you exposed the salt of the first century to moisture, the sodium chloride would evaporate and what's left would not be salty anymore. So the salt, could not be used to wilt weeds and maintain the soil, and it couldn't be used to preserve manure from fermentation. Want that fertilizer not to ferment for a variety of reasons that should be fairly obvious, right? And it's not even good for that at that point. So too, the one who sets out to follow Christ and fails to persevere will be thrown out. This is the call to obedience, to faithfulness. The believer puts the Lord Jesus Christ first. All right, so I'm going to pause again um, and emphasize something about warnings in the Bible. We have already covered the fact that we are irrevocably saved by faith, right? By what Jesus did. So what's the purpose of warnings in Scripture? Are they for other people? No, they are for us. Why? Because the warnings are the, they are the tools that the Spirit uses to help us persevere in faith. Right? This is part of God's plan. When we encounter a warning in Scripture, it's actually written often, most often, to us, to believers. And the Holy Spirit takes it and he uses it to encourage us to persevere in our faith. It's the mechanism by which we are going to persevere in faith. That's why the warnings matter. It's part of God's plan. It's not a bug. It's a feature of the Scripture. Right? All right. So here are some concluding thoughts. 
Today, as we've studied our passage, we have seen what Jesus thinks about large crowds. We've unpacked these two parallel statements, the carry or the hating and carrying statements. We've seen the four things, right? We've seen that discipleship is for all believers. The call is to an unexpected death. The call is to love Jesus more than other things. And the disciple walks in Jesus' shoes. We have explored the parable of the tower builder and the parable of the outnumbered king. We've studied this third statement on the cost of discipleship. And we've learned from what I think is a, a fascinating example, metaphor, the saltiness example, that puts all of this together for us. My friends, we don't want to be those people who say to Jesus, I'm with you, but have never considered what that means. That we are called to be faithful all the way to the end, to, fa- to pay that, that price. And how do you and I know that we will be willing, if we're called upon, to pay the price that will actually do it. I would submit that we look to our lives today and we we ask ourselves questions like these. Am I repenting against even the pleasurable elements of my own sin? Do I practice, wait, this is one for me, do I practice forgetting myself and being there for others, for the Lord? Am I holding loosely to my possessions? Am I exposing myself as a believer to those around me, at work, at school, at home, in our neighborhoods? It is impossible, Alistair Begg says, to be a disciple of Jesus and to live in a non-discipleship dimension. In other words, if you're going to follow Jesus, you actually have to follow Jesus. Everyone is a disciple, a follower of something. Everyone is a disciple. In our text, Jesus makes it clear either we're his disciple or we are the disciple of the world, of sin, of self, of the devil. And sometimes the devil seems to have all the good music. It's a fantastic marketer. Follow me. You'll never live in poverty. You'll never lose yourself. That's all bunk. It's all hogwash, isn't it? Right? You know it's not true. I want to say as we conclude the table class at Fremont, following Jesus will cost us our lives. It will. Here's the thing, though. It is much costlier to follow the prince of the power of the air than it is ever to follow Jesus. The cost of rejecting the Lord is so much greater than the cost of rejecting the world. And the benefits, the benefits of following Jesus as his disciple, are so much greater than the benefits that the world and its ruler has to offer. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. So, the one who trusts in Christ is never truly alone. I have felt alone, but I am never truly alone. I am with you always, Jesus promises, even to the end of the age. The one who is in Christ is never crushed by guilt. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. The one who is in Christ is never without hope. We do not lose heart. This light and momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. The one who is in Christ can never be more loved. This is real love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. And the one who is in Christ can never be made more alive. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but is passed from death to life. The disciple of Jesus, never truly alone, never crushed by guilt, never without hope, never more loved, never more alive. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen.